Welcome everyone to another HexDevs podcast. I'm your co-host Stephanie. And I'm Thiago. And today we have M. Scott Ford. Hi. Welcome, Scott. Hi, thanks for having me. To introduce our guest to all of you, I'm going to share a little bit about Scott. So Scott is the co-founder and chief code whisperer at, <laughs> of Corgibytes where he has quietly led the software maintenance revolution for the past decade, where most people find nothing but frustration, shame, and bugs in legacy code, Scott has centered his work around his genuine love of software modernization in helping others use joy, empathy, and technical excellence to make their systems more stable, scalable, and secure. We'll talk a lot about that in a few minutes. Scott's ideas have been featured in books such as The Innovation Delusion and has a guest lecturer at Harvard University. Scott is the author of three courses on LinkedIn learning, dealing with legacy code and technical debt, code quality and clean coding practices. He's also the host of the podcast Legacy Code Rocks. I love that name. <laughs> and enjoys helping other menders find a sense of belonging in a world dominated by makers. So, Scott, every time that I meet other members, now I know that they are menders, but I suspect <laughs> they don't know that term exists. And ever since I learned about that term from talking with Ernesto Tagworker, I have always shared that term with people. Yeah, um, you you are a mender. There's a definition between makers and menders. And I really want to know, did you create that term or did you learn from another field or someone else? Yeah, no, it was uh, me and my my business partner, who's also my wife, uh, Andrea. Um, I was in a Barnes & Noble one day and they had a table set up and it was like, you know, projects for makers and, and or like, you know, resources for makers. And I was like, where are the resources for people who like to fix things? Why is everything so maker focused? And, um, you know, at the time there were, there were maker fairs and make magazine and just, you know, being a maker was, you know, very much a buzz, uh, a, a buzzword at the time. And I, I felt left out as someone who likes to refine and restore and revitalize you know, pure making didn't feel you didn't feel like a place where I belonged. Uh, so I was like, you know, where where's the you know, I wish I wish there was a term. Uh, so it was through brainstorming that Andre and I, you know, came up with came up with the the term. I don't know which which one of us deserves uh, the, how much credit, <laughs> but it was like you know, this brainstorming exercise of like, well, you know, it needs to start with an M. So, cause, so, cause, cause, cause make, make starts with an M. So like what, what words that signify, you know, fixing something that starts with an M. Uh, and yeah, that's, so that's what, how we came up with Mender. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I just, I love that. And I think that every time that I share that term with people, and I also remember how I felt when I first heard about it, I was like, wow, I feel seen. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the feeling. <laughs> yeah, and and that's been my experience. Um, you know, when I first I first started giving talks about you know the fact that I like to clean up code bases. Uh, you know, I was going to to small meetup groups and went to several meetup meetup groups along the East Coast of the United States, and I would ask people to raise their hands to indicate you know whether or not they enjoyed working on a project that they inherited from someone else. And typical room, I would get like maybe 5% of people would raise their hands, but those who did were really enthusiastic about it. And like, yes, that's me. Like, I really, I really like doing that. <laughs> so definitely, I think a minority of the software community, but a, you know, one that I think has been longing to, to have some recognition and to have some belonging. And, and so it, mm -hmm. it's nice to, it's nice to see, you know, a, you know, a growing ecosystem of folks who are proud to say that they like to do maintenance activities yeah <laughs> and it's nice to put it in a positive way as well because whenever you hear the word legacy code people yeah. get anxious uh, about it <laughs> yeah but it can also it can also be a good career it can be like if you have good practices if you know how to work with legacy code it can be 
a nice way to to work and you can enjoy that right yeah and i think the if we're honest most of the projects that we typically work on are older projects that you know we we didn't create them from scratch we weren't part of the original team who started them you know like a lot of decisions were already made we're having to deal with the effects of those but that's not how software is taught right like mm-hmm. it's software is taught by starting with a blank page it's you know you know starting with a blank page is glamorized when you go to learn a new tool like the first demo the first tutorial is you know how to you know how to use it to create a new project R- rarely is it like how to you know, run a project that already exists you know it you know mm-hmm. so there's a lot of focus on that creation and 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 not enough focus on you know just diving in and getting in getting some work done i think that's a um, great point and i think that also robbie asked that when i went to the maintainable podcast mm-hmm. i was like yeah do you think that people glamorize getting started creating things and yeah I'm like yeah definitely because ever since i started working as a software developer i have never ran like a rails new for example app for anyone i have always joined existing code bases so that's it's interesting that to bring that up and yeah and it's also because uh, at least from my experience the projects that make the most money are also (laughs) sometimes the oldest ones or the ones that need a lot of improvement Mm -hmm. did you encounter that in your career as well like the projects that make a lot of money are the oldest one the ones that have been running for (laughs) some time yeah, I, I mean, I think that's been, you know, I haven't worked for a lot of startups. Like there's been uh, like one startup that I worked for, um, but most other companies that I've worked for have been, have been established. And so they've, they've had things that already exist. And, and I would say the projects that I've worked on, you know, most of them already exist or something that was common um, of the, the Greenfield projects that I've worked on in the past is they were efforts to make an improvement to an existing ecosystem of applications. And it was, you know, creating a newer version, creating a newer version of, you know, of something that already existed, Um, but it needed to still participate in the same ecosystem. So like there was a, a testing tool that I worked on for a, a jet fighter and it needed to be able to run all the same scripts and interact with all the same hardware as the system it was replacing so you know in some ways it was it was a, a greenfield project but in other ways it was also there's also a lot of a legacy to it because it was having to um you know there were a lot of other things that we couldn't change like i you know couldn't change the other components in the aircraft couldn't can change you know, couldn't change anything else we still had to run all the same test scripts and and you know it still needed to be used for debugging purposes that was a greenfield project, but it, it still still needed to work in that ecosystem. And there was another one that was a uh, you know something that would graph flight test data, um, and we were trying to um, replace an application that that did that. It just it it did it more slowly, and it only worked on certain certain hardware. Um, and we wanted something that was you know ran on more commodity hardware, it, but it still needed to process the same data file format. So and and still be able to you know graph the same information. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there, there's definitely been a lot of projects over the years where, you know, e- even though something new was getting created, it was within the realm or the within the ecosystem of something that that was already established. That's interesting. Yeah, so it's still it's greenfield, but you're replacing legacy code with something that yeah. needs to interact mm-hmm. with the legacy code anyway. Mm-hmm. So it's not like. Right. And you probably use the same techniques to make sure everything is working well together. Yeah. 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 There was, you know, a lot of work that went into, you know, making sure that you were, we were computing the correct values and you know, getting the mm-hmm. same information. And, you know, we had to convince ourselves that it was you know, working just as well as the original. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had the original to compare against. So we could like, you know, run something in the original, run something in the replacement, and then, you know, both need to get mm-hmm. come up with the same answer. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think since we're talking about naming things and um, having better terms so we can better communicate with each other, Mm -hmm. I really liked learning more about reframing technical 
that into building technical wealth. And yeah. I would love you to talk a little bit more about that because I, I, I get this, I don't know, I get this burst of energy when I talk, like, let's make a decision that we move us towards building technical wealth rather mm -hmm. than, oh, let's um, separate some time. This is free for us to tackle that <laughs> technical debt. <laughs> so could you talk more about that? definition too and what yeah well those terminologies and what led you to also create these terminologies yeah so the i think the the technical debt technical wealth technical wealth is a term that we didn't coin um we borrowed that from declan wheeland and he had given some talks about it and and written some articles and we just we really liked mm -hmm. the idea of you know flipping the debt metaphor that you know is commonly talked about, you know, technical debt, like, and in most of the conversation around that was was around avoidance. So, like, avoiding technical debt, you know, trying to, you know, pay down technical debt, like, remove technical debt, like, it was again, it was you know very much a, a negative thing, like, you know, something you don't want to create, something you don't want to leave behind, or you know, something that needs to be managed. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, wealth really spoke to the idea that you know it's you know, you know, something that you want to grow you know, it's something that you uh, want to have even more of. Uh, and, and so you really kind of kind of flip that around. I think health is another uh, is, is another one to look at. And, and so, you know, thinking about like how healthy a code base is or how healthy a project is. And I think, you know, that's, uh, and again, you can look at the positive instead of the negative. So, you know, wanting to be more healthy uh, instead of, you know, uh, less unhealthy. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also harder to say no to that. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because who who doesn't want wealth, right? And exactly. And who, and who doesn't want health? Uh, you know, those are those are things that it, mm -hmm. are harder are harder to say no to. Yeah. Uh, and instead, you can you know now you can you can talk in terms of investment, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, you know, how much time or effort are you going to invest in building wealth or, you know, becoming more healthy? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a more sustainable practice is to think about like how much continuing investment you, you want to, you want to apply. A challenge that I, that I have with a lot of people who, who rely on the technical debt metaphor is they tend to think of paying it off in, in, in spikes, like mm -hmm. they have to stop what they're doing. And, and pay it off, and then they can go back to what they were doing. But I, I don't, I don't like that approach. I think, I think that the practices that would lower technical debt and increase technical wealth are practices that you can just make as part of the way that you do things. So you can add features, and while you're adding a feature, you can uh, improve the health of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to uh, completely stop feature development in order to make improvements. Like I think you should be able to do both. Uh, mm -hmm. and there, there might be times when it makes sense to, to focus solely on a, a wealth building, you know, ex exercise, but I, I feel like those are way more rare than it gets talked about. I feel like a lot of, a lot of teams will talk about yeah. like, you know, this is our, our, our bug fix sprint or our cleanup <laughs> sprint, right? Like, I feel like those are activities that, you know, it, it's best to do them as, as you go, uh, and, mm -hmm. and not just leave them to, you know, do all, do a bunch of them all at once. Because yeah. then it also sounds like a chore. It sounds like it's mm -hmm. something we don't want to do. We're avoiding it. Like, you know, those are so, so again, like, you know, that kind of brings back the negativity of it. I think also this negative view of legacy code leads to kind of a mindset of, okay, we have to stop everything and rewrite from scratch yeah. the big rewrite, which yeah. is not mm. very useful. Like, it's rare that it never works. So I think that's kind of this mindset of we have to throw everything away and start from scratch, but then it, it leads to even more problems, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's always okay to have the goal that everything has been thrown away, right? That you will reach a point in time where everything has been thrown away. Everything has mm -hmm. been replaced. I get really nervous when I hear that teams are going to do that in like one chunk uh, mm -hmm. instead of doing it gradually. Uh, you know, I think I think it's really valid to... Um, look at an older system, 
especially in a system where like the technology that it's built with isn't maintained anymore. Like it itself Mm -hmm. has become, has been like the technology and the tools that were used to build it have been abandoned. Um, Continuing to use old tools to, to maintain something I think is really frustrating. Like if Mm -hmm. we, if we look for parallels in the world around us, you know, like if you, um, need to make an improvement to a car that was built in the 1920s, or you need to make an Mm -hmm. improvement to a house that was built in the the 1800s. You don't limit yourself to the tools that were available when it was created, right? You, you use modern tools, you use modern tools Mm -hmm. and use modern experience. Um, It's not even something someone would think about like going, going to a store and like looking for the 1820s section so they could, so they could (laughs) buy, so they could buy the right tools to use. Like, it's just, it's not even considered. Yet on a lot of software projects, when we start working on a software project, you know, we do limit ourselves to those older tools. And while I think, Mm -hmm. you know, when you've inherited a software project, it's important to make sure that, you know, you can run the application in an environment that looks similar to the way that it's running. So, you know, uh, if it was built with old tools, being able to have those older tools uh, installed to make sure that you can, you can get it working, but also see if it, see if it will, if you can build it with a newer version of that tool set, if there is a new version available, Mm -hmm. uh, see if it'll build. And if it doesn't like, can you, can you get it to, and you know, what, what, what is in your way to, to get it to work with the, with the more modern version. And if it's a tool that's been abandoned, what alternatives are out there? And then Mm -hmm. I think coming up with a migration strategy to migrate from the abandoned, uh, ecosystem to, to something something that is, uh, is you know, still actively developed. Like, I think, I think that's worthwhile, but doing that all at once just sounds really scary to me. Yeah. I, I have not seen it work. I've, <laughs> I've seen it attempted mm-hmm. many times, mm-hmm. but I've not seen it work yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've seen it attempted many times, but it's you rarely, yeah. I don't know if, I've, well, maybe once, but it was something that you mentioned, like it was a greenfield project that had to interact with the old stuff. Mm -hmm. Just Mm -hmm. one piece of it was replaced right? and it took a long time. It went over budget, but it was replaced eventually. But yeah, Mm. it took a long time. It was very hard. So yeah, you're right. Replacing, maybe replacing small pieces. Like a a component, right? A component, Mm -hmm. but not the whole ecosystem, right? Not not the whole, not the whole architecture. Like, but uh, you know, I think a, a drop in replacement for a component in an ecosystem, like that's that's doable. Like if it, mm-hmm. if, it, if it is, you know, relatively small. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, a, a really big chunk just just seems unlikely to be successful. Yeah, and it also it, it just adds so much pressure. Uh, it's it's not a good environment, I think, to be right. working at. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Scott, let's talk more about the tools and the practices that we can all apply continuously to build technical wealth. So I, in one of the blog posts from Corgi Bytes, um, I found this really cool phrase that I wanted to explore more with you. So it says the following, uncovering and deleting dead and redundant code, cleaning up while making changes and continuously looking for ways to improve the code base as you go are among the top DIY, so do it yourself yeah. tips you propose for high growth development teams. And I am particularly interested in the first part of this, in the first tips, in the first tip, sorry, which is um, finding and uncovering dead and redundant code. And I really would like to know what tools and what practices you do to uncover that code. And just to give you a little bit more context, I just last week, I. I installed Coverband on the yes. application that I was awesome. working on, and it's so cool. So I wanted to understand more about the tools that you use, what you look at, what are the gotchas, any practices that you you have to share with us. Yeah, so Coverband, you know, does uh, you know code coverage style analysis of a mm-hmm. code base in production. And I wish that there was better tooling for that outside of the Ruby ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something that, you know, I recommend people reach for often. Mm -hmm. Getting a sense of what's actually being used in production. Because that's, um, in addition to finding dead code, you can find just 
unused code. So mm -hmm. it might be code that could be executed if somebody ever clicked on the button, but no mm -hmm. one has ever clicked mm -hmm. on the button. <laughs> that is <laughs> true. <laughs> and so you could just delete the button. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there, there are not enough times where that's part of the conversation that businesses are having about their code bases. You know, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not considering often enough the cost of maintaining a feature mm -hmm. and whether or not it makes sense to, to keep a feature working. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's storming here. I don't know if you all can hear the thunder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, Okay, but I hope, but I hope it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I just saw lightning out the window. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> distracted. So I, I think, you know, in addition to there being like, you know, you know, like within a function, um, you know, a path through like three levels of if statements or whatever mm -hmm. that are never executed. Like, yeah. you know, that, that style of, of, of dead, uh, you know, kind of at the micro level that that's important and useful to know. And also, you know, at a, at a more macro level, like what features are actually being used. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that is something that, you know, business owners need to need to have better visibility into so they can make better decisions about mm -hmm. what parts of the application should be invested in. So, so yeah. I think, you know, anytime, anytime a decision is made to add a feature to an application, you know, there's an implicit assumption there that people will want to use it, right? And mm -hmm. people, people will use it. And so I, but I think that's an assumption that's rarely validated after the fact, mm -hmm. especially for an established application where like it already has a user base, right? For, for a startup or a small application, you know, that, that validation about will people use this is really kind of inherent in the, in the, in the, the, the process of finding customers and, and retaining customers because early on, you know, those features that you provide, you know, getting validation from actual users is really important. But I think for larger for larger organizations, um, you know, that, that validation step I'll, I'll think it's skipped or overlooked. So you'll mm -hmm. have, you know, um, uh, and I, I honestly see this more often with, uh, tools that are built for internal purposes. So mm -hmm. like an organization that is building a tool for their own employees. So it's not, it's never going to be seen by the public. Um, but they make an assumption about what those people need and whether or not they'll actually they'll actually use it and you know that is an assumption that i don't i don't see tested often mm -hmm. uh, yeah or or will they use as we assume they will like will mm -hmm. they actually do something completely different than we assume <laughs> yeah and the only the only thing to to be cautious of when using a when using a tool like cover band or some other kind of analysis to try to find try to find these these things is are there parts of the application mm -hmm. that are only used at certain times of the year yes so like uh let's say it's an invoicing system in the united states um when it's time for people to file their taxes mm -hmm. are there parts of the system that they would interact with but only at that time of year so if you you did data collection for like four months but you did so you know, on the opposite end of the calendar from when tax season mm -hmm. is, then you might get the false impression that they're asked, that they're okay, sections of the code base that are never used. Um, mm -hmm. Or if there is a, an automated job that runs monthly at, mm -hmm. you know, like first of the month at midnight, if you collect data from the second of the month to the, you know, 15th of the month and you're like, oh, I, you know, collect the data for two weeks, that should be good enough. <laughs> it might not be. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's something to, to, to keep in mind as well is to kind of, kind of be cautious about that. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you do take things out because you've done that analysis, be prepared to put, put something back. Um, mm -hmm. you, you might, you might end up taking out too much. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that because I know that for this application, there are a lot of importers um, and I added a calendar, uh, a reminder. I was like, okay, I will look at the data one month from now. Of course, I took a look at, at it yesterday because I was <laughs> really curious. Um, yeah, of course. And I was like, okay, but one month from now, I think we'll have 
some data. And now about mm -hmm. that seasonality was something that I wasn't thinking about it. And this application is for um, congressional folks. So I assume, um, now that you're talking about it, that maybe in the beginning of the year, they will use some features and others not. During no. elections. Yeah, maybe. during elections, <laughs> yeah, like or, that. Or yeah. while they're building the wall, they might be mm -hmm. you know, working on uh, budgetary issues. And that exactly. might be you know, different different things that they're they're doing. So there might be some seasonality. And, and yeah, so, so that's something to, to keep in mind. I've heard of people kind of instrumenting a code base in this way and then letting it sit for a year, mm -hmm. um, like, a, you know, or letting it sit for 18 months and then like waiting to make, you know, firm decisions on whether mm -hmm. or not to delete things based on that. That's a good catch. Thank there, you. there are <laughs> static, there are static analysis tools that can, uh, help identify code, uh, that is never executed. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't feel like in the Ruby ecosystem, there, there aren't really good ones. And I think, I think it come is an artifact of the dynamic nature of the Ruby language. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. very easy for code to be executed in non-obvious ways, you know, either through call, um, you know, or, or send like there, there's many, there's many mm -hmm. ways to like construct a string and that string is actually the name of a method. Uh, and then, you know, that method gets, mm -hmm. uh, gets, gets, uh, gets invoked or you, you know, I've even seen systems where like the, you know, it's, it's a, a URL endpoint that gets turned into a method name, right. Which is probably not a really good security practice, but like that, that is, you know, that is something that I've seen. And, and so it's, it's very hard programmatically to tell like what code is used and what code isn't in languages that are, uh, statically typed, um, and compiled statically. It can hmm. be the, the tooling in those, in those, uh, language ecosystems is a little bit better for, for detecting uh, dead code at mm -hmm. you know, kind of compile time or, or build time. But in Ruby, you know, kind of like runtime is pretty much what you're going to have to rely on. Yeah, but a static analysis is important if you're looking for dead, like unreachable code and things mm -hmm. like that. But you, you still need to look at runtime to see mm -hmm. which features are not that used right. or which features are not as important. So I think you need both anyway. Yeah. And one thing that I was thinking about from a business sense, I was reading a, a Twitter thread from Paticus from ProfitWell, and he was talking about looking at features that only get used by maybe 20% of your users. Right. So they are still used, but not a lot. And maybe it makes sense for them to be put on a premium plan so mm -hmm. that uh, it it makes sense financially to support those features if people are willing to pay for them right. like a premium premium price which is another aspect of it it's not just the code but also the business um, mm -hmm. around it right like yeah, it makes it, business sense to to keep those features running yeah and it, and it could be that you i'm trying to like i'm imagining like uh like something that might process a file and so you might have uh different chunks of code that support different file formats and there are some file formats you know are used often, but there are others that you're not sure if they're if they're used very often. Uh, you could make you could make make that an add-on, right? And you can you can say that you know if you want to you know you know you can inform your customer base that from now on, if they want to uh, use a particular importer, they have to pay for it. Um, and then whether or not anybody's paid for it is is the indicator that it's being mm -hmm. used. Uh, and then, you know, and then that, it, that can be, that can be the measure, um, mm -hmm. you know, or it can be something that people have to like, you know, you give them the ability to turn it on, turn, you know, turn it on or off. And, you know, that's a, like a, tr the ability to turn it on as a premium feature or something like that. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, cause then you, you are kind of matching the cost of keeping mm -hmm. it working, right? Like it, it's, it's not free to keep something that's been built working. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's hard to measure exactly how much time and energy goes into keeping something working. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's definitely not zero. Say you have a, a test suite, you know, what percentage of your test suite tests that feature mm -hmm. and how much does it cost you per, per, 
how much does it cost you from an infrastructure perspective each time that test suite is run? So then mm-hmm. you can compute the percentage of that cost. And so like, so you could, you could like, if you've got like a uh, continuous integration set up, you know, and say you get charged per minute, you could figure out like the, the, the cost of, you know, from a compute resource perspective to, to run the mm-hmm. test suite. And like, that might be um, a, a decent way to, to get a, a picture of, of what it costs. And if you have ways to measure like how often those tests fail, mm-hmm. um, like, so uh, if, if, if there is a way to kind of do that analysis for how often do the tests in that part of the application fail? And then, you know, because if they fail, then that means they had to be fixed. And so you know, in making something go from fail to failed to fixed isn't free either. Uh, so that could help you can kind of compute the cost of, of keeping it working. Yeah, that's, that's all true. Is there, like, I'm going to be really selfish here because I oh, want yeah, to have, a, I, have, I want to have a plan for this dead code, um, project. Um, I was thinking of getting the most obvious files there. They're not like being used at all and just. Uh, I don't know, maybe add them to a spreadsheet or something and say, these are the files that I would take. This this is why, well, not, not that I would take, but ask someone else, like, hey, do you know the story behind this? Like, um, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe it's behind a flipper flag or something like that. Um, and, and then I will start with those that are more obvious and really small chunks and i was thinking about that like in the back of my mind i will i have to make it easier for me to undo this if i'm wrong because i might be wrong (laughs) yeah you might you might be and yeah uh you know i think i think one thing you could do in ruby like if you're looking at a file level is to run the app in production mode in which case in ruby like especially i'm assuming this is rails um Mm -hmm. you know rails tries to load everything Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you can, uh, so if you, if there's a file that you're like, you're, you think might never be even imported anywhere, um, Mm -hmm. you could, you could add a, you could add a put statement at the top of the file and just check the console to see if, if that showed up. So it Mm -hmm. was at least imported, right? So it it was at least loaded in the, in a memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you don't see that, then you know, it's not even, it's not even loaded in the memory. So it can't be. It can't possibly be executed yeah. and unless unless there's code in the system that does dynamically load files anyway, mm-hmm. which can happen on Rails projects, but is is more rare. Then you know, then I think you know you could you could make a good case that it's it's pretty safe to pretty safe to remove. Mm-hmm. And then and then yeah, if you if you do it in a small chunk and say like you know removing this because we think it's not used anymore, you, know, you could create a tag um, for mm-hmm. that, um, and you know maybe add that to a spreadsheet to track and and say, you know, like if we, um, and, you know, maybe try to anticipate exception, exception messages that might pop Mm -hmm. up as a result of it being removed. So, um, you know, would there be any like class, are there classes or methods that are defined in there that you might get, um, you might get error messages, error messages about. Mm -hmm. And so you could almost create a playbook for, if we get an error message that says this, we need to revert this commit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yes, that's what I was looking for. Like those tiny tips that we can make this easier. And I don't know, it doesn't make us like ah okay, um, this is not gonna work. And because if you know mistakes will happen, I just fixed a bug last week that I introduced, but I fixed. So it is possible that will happen, but I think yeah. I really want to have a plan so we don't get discouraged to remove the dead code. Because otherwise, yeah. because that's the the number reason why the, the code is there, because we are not, ah, uh, I don't know, what if it's being used, right? Right. right. Um. <laughs> um yeah, and and you know, I think you know, you mentioned feature flags. Um mm-hmm. You know, if there are multiple production environments, you should mm-hmm. there should be a way for you to audit the feature flags that are actually being used, mm-hmm. um, and and then you can kind of do an assessment and say like, mm-hmm. okay, these are these feature flags that we're maintaining are are not being used in production by any customers. Are there any that are sometimes used for development purposes? Like you know, mm-hmm. that's something I've seen feature flags used used for before. Is you know kind of you know turning on some debugging or turning on some logging or something like that to help mm-hmm. help with uh, with development. 
So then, you know, kind of do a scan for those and then maybe ask, ask the folks that are in charge of, of sales or onboarding, you know, is the fact that these are supported being actively promoted, you know, are there customers who are asking about it? You know, those would be, those would be good things to know. Uh, mm-hmm. cause it could be, they're just not used yet. Um, mm-hmm. that's true. So, um, uh, or, you know, how, how long ago was it added? You know, those would be, those would be good things to know as well. And also you. maybe you could add feature flags to stuff before you remove the code, maybe. Mm. You know what I mean? So for mm. example, let's say, oh, I think this file is not being used or this feature. Yeah, that'd maybe be safe. You, you introduce feature flags and you mm-hmm. block the feature. And if yeah. you start seeing, oh, it's it's the feature flag is being hit, then you Yeah. Then yeah, you especially if you could you can maybe come in up come up with a naming convention that um would give like the feature fa- flag an expiration date. Uh, mm-hmm. so be like, you know, delete this, delete this flag. If not used, you know, if, if not, if, if never turned on before a year from now, then, then, you know, delete it in any code that it wraps. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, like self exploding yes. code. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it reminded me of a jam that I, I heard about from, one of my teammates, Mateus Richard, he talked about this jam called To Do or Die. So you oh. have to put the to do and then you put the date. Um, and I think, I don't know exactly how you will know, but I, I don't know if it will be like a failing test or something, but you have <laughs> to put a date on it. I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah, you could you could do something similar in your, uh, you know, like continuous integration, mm-hmm. you know, process. Uh, there's a, a JavaScript library called better mm. <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, there's some techniques that it employs that you might be able to, might be able to borrow and learn from, but it, uh, it lets you write tests about the code base. And then you can basically, you can, you know, that test will fail mm-hmm. if the metric gets worse. So you can, uh, and so you could maybe make make one that's state based and be like, you know, if that flag hasn't been removed, you know, like if the tests are run after a particular date and that flag still exists, then the test will fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you could you could you could add a test to the continuous integration uh, that would that would fail uh, if if the flag still existed in the Java ecosystem. Uh, there's a, a project called uh, Arch Unit or Arc Unit. Um, I think it's like short for architecture, so I'm never sure how, how to pronounce it. But it's A R C H, uh, and there's one for the .NET ecosystem as well. It's it's ArchUnit.net, mm-hmm. and it lets you write tests about this about the application's architecture. So you can say like, you know, no classes from this namespace are allowed to call this other namespace. So like in 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 Rails, mm-hmm. it would be neat to say that like, you know, write a test that says that like no model method should call a controller method, right? Like mm-hmm. if you could write that as a test of the code base, that would be really nice because that's something you just shouldn't be doing. <laughs> or like a model a model method, not calling a helper method, not, you know, mm-hmm. not calling a, a you know, view helper method because then you, you know, like anywhere that the architecture is being violated. So like the, if the, if the model is, is asking the, the view layer for information, Mm-hmm. Then, then there's information that's in your view layer that belongs in the model layer. If the controller is having to ask the view information, and then mm-hmm. it's information that belongs in the controller and not in not in the view. So yeah, so if you can, you know, you can craft craft uh, tests uh, that way. Uh, but those are like you know tests that you can write about the code base itself, which I think is a, is a neat mm-hmm. idea that you could add a test to continuous your continuous integration process mm-hmm. to ensure that something stays stays true, mm-hmm. uh, and you can you know test it to make sure that it's working by like forcing it to fail. But I especially like like better and how it how it works with those metrics. Like you can you can define a better metric to say that like a certain methods like complexity should never go above its current value. And so so then that way you can you can kind of acknowledge that it's its current complexity score is maybe higher than you want it to be, but you don't necessarily have time to get it where you think it should be but you at least want to lock it down so it's not going to get any worse. Do you think it can be a good strategy to, for example, say, measure the code quality or the score for the code base and then make a plan and say, okay, so we're at C right now. 
we want to go to B in the next three months, and that's our goal to improve the, the code base. What are kind of the strategies people can can use? Yeah, I think I think that's that's really valuable. Um, like you know, kind of measuring you know measuring quality and measuring how it changes over time, and kind of coming up with plans like that. So like, Code Climate has pretty good Ruby support. Um, I like to use that on on my projects, and it will kind of you know give you a letter grade for each file, uh, as well as giving you a letter grade across your project, and it will send you an email. If uh, if you add if you add a file uh, that has like less than an A, and it will send you an email if you have a file that used to be an A and like is now a C, uh, so you can kind of you kind of stay on top of those things. It can also automatically add issues into your issue tracking system for anything that it's detected. Uh, you you can set it up to do that. And yeah, I think you it also has has graphs that you can look at to kind of see like how how you've been trending over time. And you can kind of come up with a plan to say that, you know, like these files, you know, these particular files are ones that you want to be better. Another thing that I think is important to take a look at is w when doing that analysis is how often things are changing. In general, in general, the things that change more often and the things that have changed more often recently are the ones that you'd want to make sure are the cleanest. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, an analysis that, that, we do at Corgi Bytes is, you know, we wrote a little script to do this. We take the data from a code climate analysis and we take the code coverage data and then we uh, collect uh, churn information from the mm. source code repository. And then we correlate that uh, across all the files mm -hmm. in the project. And so we can kind of see which, which files mm -hmm. in the project might need special attention. So the files that have, you know, really poor code coverage, really poor, um, complexity and you know really high churn. So it's mm -hmm. a file that's changing. It's a file that's changing often. It's a file that's very complex, and uh, it's a file with really poor code coverage. Mm -hmm. That's one that needs attention. It needs attention. So you know, using a system like Code Climate, or you can use uh, Sonar, uh, you know, either Sonar Cube or Sonar Cloud. Um, to it produces similar letter grades. I wanted to share the a tool that I know. That helps for with Ruby code bases is Skunk from from Ernesto too. It calculates the 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 sure. Skunk score, mm -hmm. and so it takes yes. into consideration the churn, the code coverage, yep. and, and all of that. It's very cool yeah, that, too. I think it that is that is be the next chain. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So so I and I liked I liked Ernesto's naming for that. The Skunk is. Uh, I thought that, I thought it was it was good because like you. Know, you know, skunks skunks don't <laughs> smell well. Uh, code yeah. scene is the is the project that I was trying to remember. So code scene will uh, kind of identify hot spots in the code base, uh, and it, it takes um, uh, churn uh, in, into account when it's doing its analysis. It can also it also has some ways to do analysis based on team members. So you can look at a chunk of code and see like if if has that section of the code base only had one author, and then like that is a risk if that person leaves. Or you can also like you can also tell it like what like who is on your team currently, and then it can identify chunks of the code base that you you might not have knowledge of because you know the people who the people who last touch it touched it are no longer on the team. So those would be riskier parts of the code base to make changes to. And so yeah, so it's able to do you know some of that analysis as well. So those are you know kind of the, some of the neat information that you can get out of the, the source control system. Oh, that's really that's cool. Yeah, the idea of I mean, I guess kind of a buzz factor. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Oh, this person is leaving, and this person knows everything about this feature. So please talk to this person and and you know share the knowledge with everyone. <laughs> that's yeah. Cool. That's um. That's actually also a great thing to do when you are leaving a job, maybe. <laughs> Like, oh, because we just had someone, one of our students, uh, he was asking like, hey, I'm leaving the company. I'm the only dev. Well, in this case, the person was the only dev. But even if you're not and you want to leave, you know, as much documentation and support for the person who is going to replace you, um, I think that's a good thing to do. Like, hey, uh, this part here, I will document those things. Those yeah. are definitely the ones that I, I am the only one who has knowledge and you can use that to help you leave the job in a good term. Yeah, and and even if you know, and if you use a, a tool 
you know, that can help you help you assess that, such as like code scene, then, you know, you can maybe it, there are parts of the code base that you don't remember being the only author of, uh, you know, but you could, so you could do that analysis and be like, oh, yeah, I, I would, I am the only person who's ever, you know, worked on payments or billing or working with a particular API or, you know, you, you know, those are, those are things that you might not remember, remember having done. And, and so, docu- yeah, I can definitely see see value in, in documenting those before you leave. Yeah, so many cool things. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I'm <laughs> curious to know about working with people that are not menders or people that don't understand their mindsets. So for example, I know that sometimes when people work on a code base for a long time, they just accept that it's bad. They just say, oh, it's bad. They don't see the problems anymore sometimes. Maybe you get used to it. And when you come in and you start suggesting some changes, things you could do, you know, if you want to follow the strategies that we were sharing here, how can you kind of convince them to, because it's, if you think about it, they will have to change a little bit. It's more work for them in a way, but it's going to make things better in the future. So how can you work with people? Yeah, I think, you know, so I, I don't, I, I like to be really careful to not think that like makers are bad, right? Like, or makers make makers produce bad code. Um, I like partnering with a maker because to me that means that like, you know, they can go they can go just you know make messes and not have to stress about it, and I will happily clean up behind them, right? Like, and so like the you know the the things that they would rather abandon, I'm happy to take over. Uh, and so like, you know, they can kind of get something to that, you know, if you think of like the 80, 20 rule where it's like, you know, you know, 80, 80% of the progress can be made in 20% of the time. Uh, you know, they like to get something to that, to that, you know, 80% point and they, that last 20% to finish it off is not what they, what they want to do. That's the bit that I would enjoy doing. Uh, so, so I think, you know, that can be fun, but I have seen a challenge where like, I, you know, I've been the only mender on a team of all makers and where kind of the solution to every problem is one that kind of comes through, you know, kind of comes through that maker lens where it's like, uh, you know, the, the only solutions that are really considered are the ones that like a maker would enjoy doing or that a maker, you know, thinks, think, uh, makes sense. That can be frustrating. I think it also, there, there was a, a client that, that we had at Quirky Byte several years ago who told us that he matched the the folks on his on his projects he looked at what the project needed and he looked at where each person uh, that he could staff on that project he looked at where each person kind of fit on the maker mentor spectrum and so if a project needed maker energy to kind of like you know re, to kind of like you know reinvent itself or to you know to to kind of you know it, you know, experiment with, with new directions, then he would make sure that there were makers that were staffed on it. If a project like was struggling from the perspective of, you know, you know, maybe it's struggling with a lot of technical debt or, you know, you know, there's, there's a lot of bugs that are getting reported or it's not very stable, then that's a project that needs mender energy. So making sure that, that, you know, there were menders who were staffed on it. So, you know, I think you can, you can kind of look at like what a project needs and make sure that the, the people who have staffed on it kind of fit in with that. You know, I think it's, 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 you know, also sometimes you have to do things that you, you, you don't like, like, which <laughs> isn't fun, but you know, some, you know, sometimes it does happen that you will be a mender on a team that, that is making, uh, and, and that's, and that's what's needed. And you, you know, you can be honest that like, you're not the best at that. And, and you know, it's not something that comes naturally to you, but you know, you can, you can, you can still, you know, still work to be productive. Uh, and I think that the same can be true for makers. If you know, if makers can recognize that, like, you know, mending is what's needed, and not try to blow up the project to so that it becomes a a, a great you know a, a maker effort, and instead, like, you know, kind of lean into that refinement. You know, I think it's possible even for makers to to find things on older projects that do involve a lot of creation. So I think especially for say there's a new file format that needs to be needs to be added to the system like that you know even though you're adding something adding a new feature to a system that's going to feel like a maker activity because it's a brand new file format or maybe there's a brand new api or uh, a new a new database 
uh, to you to consider using or, you know, adding a caching layer or, you know, exploring, you know, a DevOps platform. Uh, you know, those are, those are mentor activities that also involve a fair bit of you know, experimentation and the kind of work that, that uh, a maker, Yeah, I hope that right. answers your question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that your manager having that knowledge of the differences between makers and menders and thinking about, okay, what is needed here to make things better? How can I allocate people to work on the right things? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a good, it's yeah. a good yeah. thing. And I, I like the maker energy and mainder energy. <laughs> I think that's yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah, because and I think and it's something that we've noticed over the years on our team is that it isn't really a binary. Uh, that you know, it, it is more of a spectrum where uh -huh. you know, we have some folks on our team who enjoy mender things for about fifty percent of their time, but the other fifty percent of their time, they really would like it to be maker maker activities, and and so kind of knowing where somebody kind of sits on the sits on the spectrum and make sure that they're not always given you know the, the kind of work that they uh, they that they don't enjoy. Oh, um, I had so many more questions. <laughs> Well, we'll have to schedule another one, Scott. Yeah, yeah, that, I'd be I'd be happy to, to to chat about other stuff. So yeah, yeah, it just the time went so fast. Yeah, but yeah. I, I wanted to ask you: Is there something you want to um, share before we go? We finish the, the episode. Yeah, so I, I guess the only thing I would think of to share. Sorry, I initially thought I didn't have anything, but I changed my mind. <laughs> is you know the Legacy Code Rocks community. So it, you know, if if you if you listen to this and you're like, oh, I'm a mender, where where do the menders hang out? You know, there is a, there is a community for that. It's you know over. You can find it at legacycode.rocks. There's a, a Slack workspace that you can join at slack.legacycode.rocks. Um, we've got a, a weekly virtual meetup that meets uh, 1 p.m. Wednesdays uh, U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, and yeah, that, that can be a, a great place to, to hang out. So yeah. And also go to MenderCon. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then we'll have information for, for MenderCon. We, we are currently planning, uh, for, for next year, May 10th, 2023, it'll be a virtual event again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, mark your calendars. Uh, yes. Yes. We'll, we'll all be there. Yeah. Also awesome. excited. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Scott. So people can find you at corgibytes.com, legacycode.rocks. Mm -hmm. Is there any, any other place that you hang out more or people can follow you? I have been uh, using Twitter for a while, um, but I might decrease my Twitter usage given recent <laughs> events. Uh, yeah. So reaching out to me on LinkedIn is probably a, a good, uh, good, good next place. I'm not super active though. So you might mm -hmm. send me a message and I might get back to you a couple months later and, and I'm not ignoring just you i'm i just ignore everybody so <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. it's not personal <laughs> it's not personal <laughs> yeah. oh awesome. thank you so much scott we will definitely schedule another one i hope you yeah. had a, a great time i learned a lot and... yeah me too it was amazing yeah. Yeah. okay yeah thanks for having me yeah thank thanks you so, so much. much for for all your work and making us have the community to talk about these things and feel good about our craft you know our yeah. work, our creativity, <laughs> and creating awesome. and creating wealth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's nice nice to hear that that uh, that you found that impactful. So, thank yeah. thanks for sharing that. Thanks everyone for listening. Please check out our website hexdevs.com for more podcasts. We also had a an interview with Ernesto. We talked about code quality too. More focused on, on Rails and Ruby projects. And yeah, check out our website, follow us. Let us know if you enjoyed this episode and which tools you're going to use to improve, well, to create technical wealth. We'll see you on the next episode.